Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening to our members and friends on Zoom. I'm delighted to, my name is Tony Burton. I'm the secretary of the society. And it's great pleasure tonight to introduce Alex Redick, who is the general director of Scottish Opera. He became general director when he came to Scotland from New Zealand in 2006. Before that, he'd been executive director of New Zealand National Exhibition of Arts, an international exhibition, which he ran for a number of years. And then he became director of the new New Zealand Opera. His contribution to opera in Scotland has been remarkable. He has overseen productions that have traveled around the world, have won awards. He has commissioned many new pieces of opera shown for the first time. He, he encourages and oversees one of the finest education programs for children in opera, probably more advanced than anywhere else in Europe. He encourages and arranges for opera to be transmitted across Scotland to more than 50 locations, sometimes in villages way away across the sea in winter. He encourages emerging artists. And not least, he's shown a dab hand at encouraging good new architecture. Look at the extension of the Theatre Royal and that wonderful foyer. I think uh, uh, Alex is a modest man, but I think I can generally say his contribution to opera in Scotland has been tremendous. Alex. Talk about raising the bar. <laughs> anyway, good evening. Uh, Indeed, I am Alex Wiedek, and it's my great pleasure to be here speaking to you this evening. Um, and indeed, Tony, it's 16 years and three days since I started at Scottish Opera. Uh, don't quite know why, but I remember the 6th of February for some reason. Um, and uh, as Tony alluded, I've you know, had a busy life both in uh, the world of opera in New Zealand and indeed the world of opera here in Scotland uh, and in Ireland and in lots of other places. A lot of it was freelance before I was finally lured into a more uh, grown up role, if you like, uh, with the New Zealand Festival before I then went to the then new New Zealand Opera Company. But, um, but I also just want to put out there that indeed I started life as a stagehand about 40 odd years ago with the New Zealand Opera Company. And it was there that the kind of light, as it were, first went on. And um, I wouldn't want anyone to think of me as an incomer, in inverted commas. I've been in and around and had the great pleasure of living and working in Scotland for many summers from 1988, to be precise. And that included being part of the Edinburgh Fringe, Mayfest here in Glasgow, Scottish Opera in, in another role, and of course, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. So I think myself and the family have landed here uh, with a reasonable degree of legitimacy over the last 16 years. Um, I thought, I thought I might pose three questions uh, to myself this evening, if you like, and for your, uh, for you to consider, and they sort of, yeah, and indeed, attempt to answer them myself in the finest traditions. Um, so the first question is, what is opera? Secondly, who is Scottish opera? And thirdly, who are we as an opera company in the 21st century? So, firstly, what is opera? And you know, I'm conscious that many people both are on screen tonight and indeed in the room here will have already a long, well-established history with not only Scottish opera, but with the art form. So I'm going to just take you through a, a brief potted history. Um, and it goes a bit like this. Uh, so opera is an art form that can, can be seen to have been developed from several strands of music making prevalent at the end of the 16th century. One, was the development of the madrigal from a setting of short poem 
for several voices to a more obviously dramatic scene in several sections telling some sort of story or depicting some sort of extended emotional sequence. Indeed, there are wonderful examples of these in the six books of madrigals published by Monteverdi in the early 1600s. But earlier composers also lay the groundwork for this type of composition. The drawback of these in terms of pure storytelling was that the text was frequently obscured by imitative counterpoint between the voices. This parallels the similar objections that many have in church music of the time. In other words, that the musical treatment of the text was so elaborate that the words could not be understood. So the other strand was a desire led by members of a group calling themselves the Florentine Camerata, obviously cultured business and noble men from Florence who wanted to use the model want to use the model of the plays of the ancient Greek stage to revive the art of storytelling through music. The text would simply be sung to musical pitches in a style we would probably recognize nowadays as recitative, which would be accompanied by simple chords from a keyboard instrument. It's also why the Greek myths provided the plots for many of these early operas, the first of which is generally held to be Daphne, written in 1597 by Giacomo Perry. It also contained simple choruses, which were sung in block chords, again, so the text was made clear, and small orchestral interludes, which may have been danced to. The operas of Monteverdi, which were among the earliest still surviving, follow this general pattern. Meanwhile, interestingly, in France, the development of a more hybrid form, the opera ballet, in which the dance element was as important as the singing, and in which the role of the orchestra was expanded to help, to help forward the drama was one of the important legacies of the court of the Sun King, Louis XIV. The element of ballet would remain a feature of French opera right through its history until the beginning of the 20th century. And for those of you that are observers of uh, opera companies in France, you will note that many of them have a ballet company attached and described as the opera ballet of Lyon, for example. As the singers involved in these early attempts at musical storytelling became more skilled, skilled, they in turn demanded more opportunity to show off their voices while telling the stories and the solo aria came into being. By the time Handel was writing his operas in the first 25 years of the 1700s, the aria was the main form of vocal expression. The singers were calling the shots and opera had become a vehicle for vocal display, first and foremost, with the plot a mere peg to hang the music on. This led Gluck in his setting of Orpheus, of Orpheus's legend Orphe and Eurydice, and in his other operas written in the 1760s and 1770s, to try to reform the art by getting back to using the music, both vocal and orchestral, simply to tell the story and to minimize or even eradicate vocal display for its own sake. I have a couple of images here to share with you of our own um, Orphe and Eurydice, directed by Ashley Page, known to some of us as the former. Uh, uh, boss of Scottish Ballet. And he created an amazing production for us with designer Johan Engels uh, that really brought in a very visual, extraordinarily visual way, the opera to life for us. I'll leave this image hanging for a moment or two for you. <clears throat> Since then, the whole history of opera can be viewed as a centuries old battle to keep these various strands within bounds. In the early 19th century, with Italian composers like Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini, vocal display became a paramount and you know, sometimes as disparaging referred to as canary singing. Um, while north of the Alps, after Gluck, composers like Mozart, Beethoven, even though he only wrote one opera, uh, Weber and Ben Wagner gradually expanded the orchestral contribution from a mere accompaniment to a more dominant role and the creation of a complete work of art or Wagner's Gesamtkunstwerk which would use all of the available elements to tell the story. Just to share with you a couple of images from Scottish Opera's Ring Cycle, maybe known to some of you that we presented in the early part of this century. There's something about these rhyme maidens that I always find uh, particularly captivating. Maybe it's the energy and the fact that they're firmly landed in the middle of the 21st century that somehow uh, uh, um, echoes with me. While later 19th century composers of other nationalities, even Bizet and Puccini, adopted these techniques, they were often severely castigated and labeled Wagnerian. It's also important, more so now post COVID, to remember that the idea of a hushed audience sitting in a darkened auditorium 
and following a drama told in music all the way to its conclusion is a comparatively recent idea in the grand scheme of things. Dating only from the mid 19th century, Wagner again is the reason we have to thank for that. Up until then, a box at the opera with convenient curtains was used for entertainment of various kinds, allegedly, of which actually listening to and watching what was being presented on stage was allegedly only one element. 18th and 19th century French operas frequently introduced their ballets towards the end of the performance, simply because many of the mainly male patrons would still be at dinner when the earlier acts were being performed. And oddly, similarly today, favorite singers would have their followers and fans who would pay attention when those singers appeared on stage, but would be less interested in other parts of the opera. And as the vogue spread to other countries, particularly those in Eastern Europe, opera also became a vehicle for retelling of their own history and legends. Many 19th century Czech and Russian operas exemplify this trend. There's an argument that the heyday of opera may have been the end of the 19th and beginning of 20th centuries when the grandness of the art form reached a peak. During the 20th century, many operas were still being written, of course, but often on a smaller scale, financial considerations playing a significant part in this development, though the attractions of the art form proved still as appealing as ever for composers. Many singers, meanwhile, seem to prefer the well-trodden paths of earlier composers, frequently taking refuge in discovering more of the operas of the past than introducing new ideas. The demands made on their voices by the musical language of many contemporary composers undoubtedly played a part in this. The most successful 20th and 21st century operas are often those in which the musical language, while not in any way imitating that of older composers, builds and further develops the traditions they established. Equally, it's fair to say the age of the prima donna is not yet past. There have always been and continue to be singers who've caught the public imagination. In the very positive sense of the word, artists like Dame Janet Baker and Sir Thomas Allen are well Kent voices and faces with us at Scottish Opera. Some would argue also that in the past half century or so, it is now the producer or director who has called the shots, not the conductor. Though more recently, it seems that more radical directorial ideas get, ab get abandoned as the simple desire to tell stories in an operatic form becomes more prevalent again, thankfully. For example, I'm really um, pleased to know that we have Glasgow-born director Sir David McVicker uh, very closely associated with Scottish opera and his rich productions have graced the world stages largely because he is an incredible artist and an incredible musician and an incredible director and it's the, it's the sum of those parts that enables absolutely amazing performances uh, to be staged by him. It's also interesting of course that he uh, there are some, if not many, who give him credit in particular for reviving the fortunes of the Metropolitan Opera in New York because of the quality and theatricality of the productions that he's brought them over the, over the last decade or so. What is simply marvelous and, and in my view, unable to be achieved in any other performance art form in any way is that when all the elements involved come together, the results make what Dr. Johnson referred to as exotic and irrational entertainment one of the most satisfying performance art forms we have. And as, I, and as I gaze around the opera scene over the last decade, I would suggest that there's been an absolute explosion of both opera form and opera function. Compared with 15 years ago, alongside an array of amazing productions on stage, we now have so many smaller opera companies rightfully claiming their space a plethora of summer opera festivals across the UK presenting interesting and exciting new productions, an abundance of new writing, the full embrace of the digital era, both technically and for, uh, and for audiences, and indeed this evening is an example of that, uh, and the happy diversions into the likes of the world of silent opera and an incredible um, coterie of emerging artist programs for post and postgraduate um, artists and singers. So in my view, I don't know, but I think the opera space is pretty, pretty positive out there at the moment. Who is Scottish opera? And sub question, what sets us apart? So um, many of you will know this, but for those that don't, 
I would just uh, remind you that Scottish Opera was founded in 1962, June the 5th, 1962, when a young Scots conductor, Alexander Gibson, returned to Scotland to work with the RSNO. And he then determined to also create an opera company to, in his words, lay the treasures of this art form at the feet of the Scottish people. And supported by his uh, fellow founders, Ainsley Miller, Ian Roger, and Richard Telfer, a gang of four, as they became known, Scottish Opera opened on the 5th of June, 1962, in the King's Theatre here in Glasgow, with an inaugural season of two quite contrasting operas, Puccini's Madame Butterfly and Debussy's Palias and Malassande. I'm going to just move to an image from our reasonably recent production, uh, directed by Sir David McVicker of Palias and Malassande. I think the, the point that's really interesting about this double bill 60 years ago is the is the tone, the artistic vision set of quite contrasting repertoire for Scottish opera at a time, particularly when whilst uh, Bacini and Verdi were reasonably familiar um, uh, composers to work with, there was very little French repertoire being presented in the UK. And so Alec, Alec Gibson from the get-go set out a vision that was about well-known and lesser-known works in that inaugural season. And that, to a large extent, is what we hold, hold on to to the present day. <clears throat> so indeed, we as a company are quietly getting ourselves ready as we come out of COVID for our 60th anniversary in about four months' time. And so with apologies to the geneticists who are here this evening, I often describe Scottish opera as having four strands to its DNA. And I say this because whilst we are so much more than the operas we present on the large stage, nevertheless, we are nothing without the operas we present on the large stage. So the first of the four <laughs> strands of DNA, the uh, first strand really is our main stage repertoire and the touring of that, particularly from Glasgow to Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Inverness. And by main stage, we mean presented on the large stages, but opera, um, presented as the composer intended it to be presented uh, and um, with, with chorus, with orchestra, obviously with scenery, with uh, costume sets, the whole nervous works coming together with an amazing collection of singers, a really clever director, a marvellous conductor to present work at a scale as we all know it and as it is intent, was, is, was intended for the large theatres. But um, in putting a sort of balanced basket together of repertoire every season, uh, there are many, many factors that Stuart Stratford, who's our music director, and myself and the team have to hold in tension. There are, of course, the composers, um, which composers would we like to present this season or whose work would we like to present this season? What language? Perhaps we might not present it, present it in the language it was written, but we might defer to uh, English. Um, we also have to consider and weigh out whether we can afford to do uh, all of our operas with a chorus or whether we have to find some non-chorus repertoire, whether we weigh out whether we revive an existing production or whether we create a new production. Money, of course, as ever, plays a huge role in this. But also, most importantly, actually, our job is to create a balanced basket of repertoire of work that you guys, our audience, want to come and see. We also try to be balanced the frequency of performance against audience demand. So in other words, uh, something like a La Boheme or a Madame Butterfly, we typically return to about every six or seven years um, uh, because that uh, statistically shows us it's about the right rate of return in terms of repeating. We also have to weigh up with our productions, uh, do we create a new production of a favorite title or do we uh, revive an older existing production? Those of you that have attended our performances will undoubtedly have seen Tosca, uh, the fantastic Anthony Besh production designed by Peter Rice that uh, is just over 41 years old. It's had nine appearances with Scottish Opera and numerous appearances both in Europe, North America, even as far south as New Zealand. And it's a really strong, stylish production. It's distinctive. And honestly, I don't see any reason why we would contemplate a change. However, other new productions do need, uh, or other, we sorry, we do need to create productions of other popular titles. 
And um, over the years that I've been here, we've tried to ensure we've got a really good muster of really good quality productions of the more popular titles, as indeed I believe any self-respecting National Opera Company must have. I feel we have to have an artistic view on these titles, um, particularly the most frequently performed operas from around the world. And uh, this, uh, this particular um, statistic is, a, is an accumulation of uh, uh, titles presented by companies, not numbers of performances. But inevitably, the top three are uh, in no particular order, but inevitably, Puccini's La Boheme, Bizet's Carmen, and Verdi's La Traviata. But also, normally clustered within the top 10, you've got Così, Barbara of Seville, Don Giovanni, Marriage of Figaro, and Rigoletto. I've got a couple of photos here of our fabulous production of uh, The Barbara of Seville, directed by Sir Thomas Allen, which was, um, we, we Scottish Opera had not done this for a very long time, brought it into rep, we've done it twice, and um, it continues to be a really fabulous audience favourite. And then Sir Thomas Allen, as part of a, a body of work he's created for the company, he also uh, created a terrific production of Don Giovanni, of Mozart's Don Giovanni, which um, it would be rude of me not to say to you that we're intending to stage it a little later this year. And so um, all customers suitably welcome. Uh, <clears throat> we also, um, I'll just go back to the, um, oh, sorry, can I to just stay there for a moment, sorry. Um, we also, I believe we have a duty of care to our audiences to make, to make sure that when we can, we present a broad range of other of operas. So in any one season, Stuart and I will try to put together two popular well-known titles mixed alongside lesser known works from either better known composers or operas that may have not been done very often. And when we're exploring the idea of works that have not been done very often, it's quite common to bump into the sort of accidental rule of thumb that goes, gosh, when did Scottish Opera last do this title? And the answer is inevitably about 25 years ago. Um, who'd have thought? Uh, it's also fair to say that, you know, uh, inevitably, some people would argue that opera is not just for them. Uh, fair enough. But I think we have three tools, three key tools that we deploy to help us as much as possible. The first tool is a bit invisible, but it is actually that our average net ticket price is typically just below 30 pounds because we're very keen that the price point uh, doesn't feature as something that would attract the attention of the red tops. <laughs> We're also conscious that people have choices to make about how they spend their money. And we work very hard to keep uh, our ticket pricing at a point where most of us, most of you can afford to go for a reasonable ticket price. You do also have to remember that actually on a good night, there's at least 140 people involved in telling that story. So we can't give it away. Um, but also 30 odd quid is considerably less than what many people are happy to pay for a significant sporting event or other uh, um, uh, evening in a theater or a, a hall somewhere. The other secret, uh, but very good uh, tool has been our under 26 10 pound ticket, which we launched about 15 odd years ago. Uh, it, um, it's, it's initially was designed to encourage people like us to bring uh, our children or our grandchildren or our nieces, et cetera, to the opera. We would pay the normal price and those young people would be sitting next to us for 10 pounds. So it became a way of opening the art form easily uh, for both financial and sort of access reasons. It then was um, very happily widely adopted by many people, uh, particularly in the universities. And uh, these days, approximately 10% of our audience is in fact uh, coming on the under 26 10 pound ticket, which is brilliant. There are all sorts of uh, lovely anecdotal outcomes, one of which is that say other than the opening night of the season, typically our average audience demographic has um, come down somewhat. <laughs> There's a lot of younger faces in the auditorium and, and, and indeed in the foyers. Secondly, interestingly, many of the folk using those tickets are very happy to be the best dressed people in the foyers. And I think that's a really interesting kind of spin of the cliche of going to the art form, coming to opera. And thirdly, there is a certain gentleman who will remain nameless who took exceptional advantage of our ticket as a dating model and would appear frequently at performances with a different young woman in tow. So I congratulate him on his um, endeavors. I suppose 
the thing that we actually do seriously really well is that we work incredibly hard on our musical and theatrical standards to ensure that you, our audience, have as good and emotionally satisfying experience as possible. The second strand of our uh, DNA is smaller scale touring. And we, Scottish Opera, have been touring uh, at all sorts of levels, scales around Scotland for well over 30 years. And it's not always obvious, but in fact, we have a gene pool of over 110 smaller communities around Scotland from which we seek to perform roughly once every roughly once every three years. So we try to get our sort of internal KPI, as it were, as we try to get to about 35 communities every year with our smaller scale touring. Uh, a good question I'm often asked is why are we so committed to, Scot to touring in Scotland? And fundamentally for myself and for us at Scottish Opera, I think national reach, it's a sort of powerful articulation of our commitment and indeed what I believe to be our duty to the Scottish audiences, but also our duty to the Scottish taxpayers, you know, to genuinely reach as much of Scotland as we can. It's certainly true, I mean, as an aside, that for many years and in many communities, we have often been the only professional performance that, that reaches that community in any given year. It's also true, and indeed we were in Webster's last night with our uh, the launch of our um, spring tour, or Opera Highlights tour. It's also true that many of the venues we go to in there might only hold 100 or 120 or 150 people. But note that those venues are exactly the right size for the communities in which they're landed. And we often have incredibly full houses. And I've um, got a lovely memory of being many years ago in Balahulish when we were touring there with a small production, absolutely pouring down, you know, classic, Scottish winter weather pouring down and a woman arrived wearing uh, a very long uh, dryser bone that went sort of down to her boots and a dryser bone hat. And she came into the foyer, took off her dryser bone hat to reveal beautifully prepared hair, took off the long coat to reveal this gorgeous dress, pulled a pair of high heels out of her poacher's pockets and within sort of 30 seconds had been transformed into someone who was definitely dressed for a good night at the opera. And I asked her how long would it have taken to come to, to the Balahulish Hall. And she said, well, it's taken me about 20 minutes to stomp across the fields from the farm. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a, for me, it was a really interesting introdu introduction to uh, the commitment our audiences show. In our 50th anniversary, 10-ish uh, years ago, we set about delivering what we called 50-50, which is we managed to visit across all of our work, 50 communities in our 50th anniversary with the sub-statistic that 90% of the population of Scotland was within 30 minutes drive of one of our performances across that year. And when you consider that Scotland in its totality is approximately 40% of the land mass of the UK, uh, I don't think that was too bad an achievement. However, the bars now moved in our 60th anniversary to try and to nail 60 uh, performances in our 60th. Uh, the third strand of our DNA is all the work that we do in education and outreach. And much of this um, is less visible. So we are, as Tony very kindly said, we are the first, you know, we are the, the you know, we were the first of our kind and we're still the oldest outreach and education team of any opera company in Europe, uh, established over 50 years ago in the early days of both uh, Alexander Gibson and Graham Vick. And the ethos of the team really is to break down barriers to the art form, connect communities, inspire people from all backgrounds and, and inspire people from all backgrounds through opera. We've been a trailblazer in our community arts engagement across Scotland and internationally, and we've played a seminal role in educational experiences for generations of Scottish people. And we've developed a year round program of youth and community work. And again, in our travels, we bump, frequently bump into people who say, I can remember going to see you in a primary, the work of the company in a primary school, and then my kids went, and now my grandkids are going. So I think that's something really powerful about the roots that we continue to land in the communities. And our, our primary schools tour, which has now engaged over half a million children in the arts across all of the 32 local authorities. And we've worked with over 9,000 pupils from over 130 schools every year. You know, so innovate, we also do innovative work for infants and groundbreaking work for people with dementia. So the, the package of it all, we create meaningful and transformative experiences for people of all ages. Uh, interestingly, one of the productions we created was uh, Bambino, which, uh, sorry, big button, Baby O. 
Bambino even. Oh, we did both of them, but the one I'm trying to remember is uh, <laughs> Baby O, which uh, um, was for sort of six to 18 month old babies as part of introducing very young people, very, very young children to uh, sound and singing. And we got quite a lot of international attention with that, and including uh, an opportunity to present it in Paris through the British Council, but also the Metropolitan Opera were quite uh, engaged with the idea. And one of my jobs on a visit to New York was to go to the Met with Peter Gelb, who is the intendant there, and wander around the buildings trying to find which space we could use to present the performance. And it happened to be a lecture theatre, not dissimilar to this, but also to find a supplementary space that could be a um, pram garage or all of the mums bringing their kids along. Who'd have thought that would be a useful use of a morning in New York? Um, we also, uh, the, well, I should say, during the pandemic, the team have, de, you know, have team, the team have devised a program uh, of new ways of delivering opera outdoors, which was crucial to support our audiences uh, returning to live performance, not only for entertainment, but also for the associated health and well-being benefits. We strive to reach out to all sections of the community that we serve and to be at the forefront of the Scottish cultural sector's capacity to affect change for good in the lives of all of our citizens, including older adults, specifically those living with dementia, children and young people facing educational challenge, challenges that also impact detrimentally on their social and economic development. Our key aim is to sharpen the focus on our program with the intersection intersectionality of the wider health and education agendas and manifesto pledges such as the development of social prescribing network and health and well-being Scotland network. Uh, this work is already well established through programs such as our memory spinners and dementia friendly performances for those living with various forms of dementia. The initial dementia friendly performances are now being extended to welcome patrons with neurological illnesses, mobility issues, neurodiverse conditions and other life challenges that make attending a full length performance difficult. Uh, in 2013, we developed a body of work called Breath Cycle, which was a project for people with cystic fibrosis, which uh, was done in partnership with the Gart Naval. And we've now taken that piece of work uh, and called it Breath Cycle 2 um, to engage long COVID patients in a series of online sessions covering vocal exercises and techniques that aim to enhance lung capacity and promote core physical strength. And interestingly, participants can also take part in workshops where under the mentorship of a composer and librettist, they can build emotional resilience and mental well-being through the creation of songs illustrating their personal experiences of the condition. Uh, we've also got a little project underway called Sweet Sounds in Wild Places, which is a creative exploration through music, plot line, and central character of the, at the heart of Walter Scott's novel and Donizetti's opera, Lucia de Lanamore. <coughs> for women and those identifying as female who have faced challenges in their mental and physical health and spiritual well-being over the past two years as a result of the COVID panic, COVID-19 panic. And we're also, we'll be having an exhibition featuring their visual song, visual art songs and creative writing, which will tour to communities uh, later in 22. I touched earlier an additional impact of the company's third strand of educational outreach identity is the international work which offers both revenue enhancing possibilities and considerable prestige for both the company and its key stakeholder, the Scottish Government, which is associated obviously with all the international recognition of our work skills and experience. Uh, this work ranges from partnerships and cooperations with education and cultural institutions in countries, including in particular China and Oman, to the international touring potential production such as uh, Baby O and Bambino, um, which, uh, as I said, have visited Paris and the Met. Uh, and interestingly, in a further endorsement of these cross-cultural partnerships, uh, the award in 2017 of the Confucius Classroom Status by Chinese Hanban Council and the partnership with the prestigious Banco D uh, International School in Beijing, which we've uh, sustained now for five years. And I guess, uh, as Tony alluded to in his introduction, the fourth strand of our DNA and one that sits very close to my heart uh, has been over the past 16 years, we've been very active in the area of new commissions. And some of you may recall our inaugural sort of 515 operas made in Scotland, where we, uh, which we premiered in 2008. And over the three years we presented, or we commissioned 15 new 15 minute operas that managed to sell out 26 performances across Scotland. Um, uh, to great, uh, I, I'm gonna divert here briefly and say what was interesting about 
the three years, each of which had five operas, was that I, I did a little bit of maths, which said if there are five composers and five librettists and five sort of subject matters broadly, five times five times five is 125. That gives you a, a sense of the range of opinions you could encounter on any one of the evenings of these 515s. But it was fascinating because we had a whole array of creative collaborators, some of whom had never worked together, some had never worked in our art form, but also it was a response to the challenge of how could we Scottish opera take our rightful place with regard to new work in the 21st century? Because without it, we'll never renew our art form. And given that opera, as many of you will know, is an incredibly complicated art form to get right, you know, to get the words right, to get the music right, and then to get it on stage, it seemed to me that the 15 minute model was a fabulous way of, you know, embracing so many people who suggested to us they would like to get closer to making new work. Uh, that led over the years to an array of uh, longer new commissions, which kind of culminated on stage in, um, uh, in uh, a new commission called Anthropocene. And um, I think I have a slide here, that's right. There we go. Anthropocene uh, by Stuart McRae and uh, author librettist Louise Welsh, who in fact uh, is on the team here at Glasgow University, very much a focus on the climate emergency and its impact. Um, uh, and uh, following on from that, we also commissioned a new film called uh, The Narcissistic Fish, which was a leapfrog over the filming of performances to the creation of an opera film, uh, set in an Edinburgh kitchen, three characters, domestic drama, uh, filmed by us, in fact, well in advance of COVID, but by the time it had been edited and was uh, prepared, uh, we were able to launch it in, in the early stages of COVID as part of our digital response to how we could uh, cope with the COVID, COVID challenges. So um, <clears throat> why, why, is, why are new commissions so important? Well, in my view, uh, I think it's our role as uh, the largest opera maker in Scotland's music and opera ecology to provide a platform for the next generation of opera makers, composers and librettists. It's kind of, it's sort of what I believe our duty as a national performing company to be. So the sum of all of these parts, main stage, touring, education and outreach and new commissions makes us, and this is where I must apologize for my grammar, but it makes us in my view, the most unique uh, opera company in the UK, if not considerably further afield. So sum of all of those parts and our sustained commitment to all of that, that it makes us who I believe we are. And I guess the third subject for my uh, um, talk this evening is, so where are we now here? Where are we now here in the 21st century? So I think the first thing I want to say is that opera is actually an incredibly resilient art form. Indeed, it's been much more resilient and much less grand um, than many would give it credit for. I mean, if you do buy into the cinematic cliche or even images from some of the grander opera houses around the world, you could be forgiven for assuming that dress codes and behaviors are, or certain dress codes and certain behaviors are required and that certain diva behaviors prevail. In my opera travels around the world, I would say that by and large, that's simply not true. I mean, I've seen in my travels that it's possible to write amazing new work, to stage incredible productions that captivate audiences without the traditional frame of a proscenium march or an orchestra pit. I mean, not that one knowingly step away from them, but if you do, it doesn't in any way, in the right context, uh, devalue or diminish the art form. I mean, obviously the conditions have to be the best possible for the music and singing to serve the drama as well as possible. But, you know, can our art form work as well in a tent in Paisley or at Opera Holland Park in London or in a warehouse in Birmingham or in a quarry in Finland or even in the back of a, one of our lorries in the Western Isles on a rainy day? Of course it can. And in the past two years, it's certainly worth saying that opera's resilience has been sorely tested and singularly re-examined. COVID has certainly been the great disruptor for the performing arts here in Scotland. And as many of you obviously know, it sadly infected and affected many of our friends and colleagues, it's closed our theatres, it's prevented many people from working and disconnected many of our audiences from live performances. But equally, COVID therefore has challenged us 
to, uh, and indeed required us to change organizationally. It's interestingly that, it's in, it is interesting that the power balance has shifted. We've always relied heavily on our freelance artisan making teams and all the crew who are freelancers who have enjoyed many repeat contracts with us and have toured with us and are almost effectively members of our family. But many have now left the sector due to COVID uh, and or have been seduced by the uh, vibrant film and TV sector, which offers both considerably higher wages, double in many cases, and uh, usually better work-life balance. And of course, the other word that we're going to use here is not only COVID, but the dreaded B word, Brexit, which um, has also led to a significant diminution uh, of labor, of uh, skills, and also of um, materials, and in turn has led to upwelling of price. Interestingly, of course, coming out of COVID, like many organizations, not particular to Scottish Opera, work-life balance has become a predominant con consideration, uh, not only for people who are with us, but also for us as we face the great resignation that has been labeled with many retirements from the orchestra and within the organization, people going, do you know what? Uh, COVID has shown me I could live my life slightly differently. Uh, I want to do things differently. And also it's sort of added a bit of jet fuel to people's perhaps slightly more lingering thoughts about whether or not to change the way they live. Uh, ye, as we are tonight, we've had to adopt and adapt to many new ways of working, including mask wearing, sanitizing, social distancing, and many other mitigations. Uh, interestingly, one of my roles pre-COVID was to prowl the orchestra pits of the theatres we perform in, and do my best to identify drafts and uh, get rid of them because obviously cold air affects both player health and their hands and also can affect instruments. Uh, working very closely with uh, our resident mechanical and electrical engineers, Mabbit, just down the road, putting a plug in for them, uh, we've been able to do a lot of work on improving and supplementing the airflow, not only in our rehearsal rooms, but also in the theatres to keep our orchestra pits safe. It's included uh, a lot of work on uh, the building uh, management systems, uh, lots of supplementary fans, CO2 monitoring, me wandering around, <laughs> seeing that there are sufficient drafts as opposed to no drafts. Uh, but um, happily, that and so many other mitigations have ensured that we, as a performing company, have been able to make our work happen, but also do our best to keep uh, COVID at bay. And also a supplementary benefit has been that actually, on the whole, we've greatly improved audience comfort in our auditorium. Also, this time has been an amazing accelerator of change, some of which we, we had in the past been slow to adopt, or indeed, to be honest, we've been quite nervous of. Um, Pre-COVID, our digital outcomes had been, our digital journey, in fact, had been lagging. There were no digital outcomes other than some podcasts. But now, over COVID, they've really developed. Um, we put together our, it was either six or seven filmed concerts or operas uh, where the orchestra were on the stage of the Theatre Royal and the cast were on the full stage. Uh, a little bit semi-staged, but it enabled us to reach out to our, and maintain contact with our audiences. We've also uh, recently filmed uh, our return to live performance with the production of The Gondoliers. That film is now, has been edited and we're now just uh, um, in negotiations with various platforms to see where we could host it. Um, good, this brings me to a bit of visual relief for you. This is uh, Gondoliers uh, on stage at the Theatre Royal. Interestingly, this production, uh, has, the scale of this production uh, has been enabled because of our partnership with both the Doily Cart Opera Company and the State Opera of South Australia, who will be presenting it in due course. And if any of you uh, uh, who are part of this journey this evening have time in hand, we will be performing uh, at the Hackney Empire in London for uh, in the last week of March. Just saying, if you'd like to attend. Um, it's also interesting, this production was absolutely uh, a salutary reminder of the perils of both COVID and Brexit. All the costume materials were very expensive to acquire because um, supply shortages, and also many of our making teams uh, had either gone off to the film land or were finding it difficult to return to work. So what should have been a relatively straightforward production for us to put together three or four years ago became much more of a um, protracted journey. 
But if we get this right, it'll be on Sky Arts at some time in the very near future. Uh, I also just earlier had mentioned that we'd uh, released the Narcissistic Fish, which had been created before lockdown, but we were Timius in its release alongside the telephone, which um, the Notties, the telephone, which we'd made for the International Festival in 2020. Um, we've also learned to work an awful lot better outdoors. I mean, we had our roots in the Paisley Opera House with our production of Pagliacci in 2018. Um, but over as 2020 marched on, and as we were coming to terms with what was initially, you know, imagined as relatively short term uh, um, uh, uh, prevention of return to work, it became clear that this was going to become prolongated. And so we try to imagine a response to this by thinking we've got an orchestra that need to work, a lot of artists around us who have been wrapped up in the furlough scheme who also want to work. You guys, our audience, are uh, desperate for some live performance. So uh, with a bit of deft footwork, we were able to um, turn our uh, South Car Park at our production studios in Eddington Street, just the other side of the M8, into uh, 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 an opera house, as it were, for about 116 people based on two meter social distancing. And then we took advantage of uh, some trailers, some scenery trailers to create three stages. You'll see one in the distance. And um, we'll go back to this slide, which was one on the eastern side for Act Three. And uh, this was the uh, trailer that was both Act One and Act Four, the uh, interior, the, the uh, sort of attic apartment that obviously features uh, at the heart of La Boheme. Uh, what was amazing, I've got to say, we could only play to 116 people, but the orchestra, instead of being safely contained within the orchestra pit, agreed to move into our paint shop. Uh, we provided appropriate ventilation. Obviously, we cleaned it up, <laughs> provided appropriate ventilation. And then Stuart Stratford, the conductor, stood. You can just see him in the distance centre photograph underneath the orange roller shutter. He's conducting both viewing the orchestra and viewing the stage. There are also some monitors to help relay his conducting to the casts. Um, you know, was it perfect? No, but was it perfect for its time? Absolutely. You know, people were incredibly moved by the performance and by a return to live performance. We learned an awful lot about testing the boundaries of social distancing. Um, the tent, uh, we, we established that if we kept some of the sides off the tent, then it was effectively an outdoor space. And the regulations meant that we could perform if we were outdoors. So that was us taking our fight, if you like, to the government to say, do you know what? We've got a lot of work we need to do here. We need your help. Here's how we think we can find a way around it. Uh, one of the other uh, unforeseen perils was the uh, warmth <laughs> of sitting underneath a clear canopy in a car park. So unusually, certainly during rehearsals, uh, many of our cast were much warmer than we'd expected. And the, I should say that the success of La Boheme in the South Car Park in 2020 led us to present a much more ambitious staging of uh, Verdi's full staff directed by Sir David McVicker. And what was interesting there, I mentioned him because when, uh, when we were discussing another project that was having to be, we had in the pipeline that will now return early next year. When I was discussing this project with Sir David, he looked absolutely bereft because all his work had been canceled. You know, this is a man who could command the attention of opera companies all around the world, three, four, five year backlog in his diary in terms of when you, if you want to book him, you've got to book three, four, five years ahead, depending on the scale of the production. Bereft, his world had stopped. It had absolutely come to a grinding halt. He lives just over the way here in Glasgow. And I was round to see him just to kind of uh, say face to face, I'm really sorry, but we're gonna to have to stop this particular project. And then sort of Stuart Stratford and I had pre-planned this, if you like, talked about it previously. And I said to David, listen, I don't suppose, Stuart and I are thinking of full staff as an appropriate offering for the car park. I don't suppose you uh, would be interested in directing it. And he turned from someone who was incredibly bereft and uh, upset into someone who the light had gone on again. And because David is both an artist as well as a director, he grabbed 
I mean, not quite the back of a fag packet, but had literally within five minutes done the first blush design for the um, full staff uh, set and then started to sketch the costumes, which uh, gave us a really enriched production. Uh, interestingly, we were also able to secure a co-production with our friends in Santa Fe. So whilst I'm not sales manager for Santa Fe Opera, if you find yourself in Santa Fe in June this year, uh, you can be entertained by that particular production. Uh, I'm conscious that I'm time bound, so I'm just going to uh, press on. Uh, I also just want to say that this is a, a slightly distorted map of Scotland, but it gives you a flavour of where we delivered uh, sorry, where we're going to deliver our primary schools touring and our pop-up opera over spring and summer in 22. In the summer just gone by, we managed to deliver 190 performances of our pop-up shows in 46 communities across Scotland. And it was just brilliant that we were able to take a couple of converted scenery trailers and offer the, through them offer the performers shelter and um, the cast and audience so the uh, audiences, as you can see here, somewhere in the Western Isles, were definitely very hardy, very resilient, incredibly weatherproof. The cast were safely on stage. And on a warmer day, this is what it looks like. And we had a, a trio of uh, Gilbert, no, five GNS productions. These are about half an hour long. In the, typically two singers, a narrator, a couple of instrumentalists, uh, an audience that could go anywhere from 20 to 150, uh, sitting in their bubbles, the singers were mic'd, obviously, because you've got to give everyone a fighting chance, but it was an amazing way of um, uh, keeping the art form alive, providing work for people, and absolutely banging the drum for Scottish opera uh, around uh, the nation. Okay, um, I think just in closing, I want to say, I think these images help to illustrate the point that we've come full circle from those noisy exploratory days 400 odd years ago, all the way around to noisy exploratory outdoor days during the pandemic years 2020 to 2022. We've learned to perform outdoors, we've learned to trust our audiences to join us, and they did. They proved they're waterproof, they're resilient, and, and very determined to re-engage with live performance and all that it means to us. And what it means to us essentially is that, you know, opera is and live performance is a shared human experience. And we bring the joy of singing, of music making and storytelling together. And honestly, I do actually feel incredibly proud of all that we've achieved over this COVID time. And not only in pivoting our business model to provide opera performances, um, but also adapting all of our years of practice to continue actively engaging with our audiences. I think we've amply demonstrated how resilient the art form is and how keen the audiences are to join us. Obviously, there is a great deal of work to be done to encourage our audiences back into the theatres and concert halls. So absolutely no room for complacency, but yes, you know, to be honest, I'm most curious about who and what Scottish Opera might be over the next 60 years. And um, I would just like to now close by showing a tiny bit of film footage. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, my glamorous assistant is going to <laughs> stop me being defeated by technology. This is film footage taken backstage during our production of Full Staff in our South Car Park in the summer. And this is Roland Wood, who um, saying the title role of Full Star. Welcome to my palatial dressing room. Uh, so here we have the fat suit. Brace yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the spectacularly made fat suit and delightful woolly socks. Uh, so as you can see, so you can see how it is nice to hang off the fat suit. I'm ready for my entrance, Mr. DeMille. It's a lot of hard work, it's a lot of pre-preparation. I mean, all the stage managers all have to be able to read music so you know, know the score inside out. And then we work from day one in the rehearsal room. So as the production's created, we learn where the entrances, where the exits of all the cast are, what props they require, what they take on, and all this is noted down. And so by the time we get to this stage, we do know it inside out. It's utterly delightful. I'm not just saying it. I really do mean it. It's been, it's um, it's been a really beautiful thing to be part of. To see that team work, to see people having to work together. It's uh, exceptional that Scottish Opera have done this in this space and created something so beautiful and so meaningful. 
Saturday night when we opened, that feeling of having an audience again was just like nothing else. I definitely had a little teary moment during Act 3, just thinking how special and truly beautiful and what feels like a great artistic achievement. So it's why we do it. The audience is why we do it. Camera and, and film and this work for, for television like we've been doing is lovely and a wonderful way to connect to audiences when we couldn't be making live work. But having an audience in on Saturday night, goodness, there's nothing like it. I was only looking shifty because I couldn't work out how to turn it off. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for indulging me this evening. Um, great pleasure to have a chance to speak to you a little bit about opera and Scottish opera. Um, I Don't think go away. I'm not going away. No, I'm handing it back to you. Don't Tony. go away. Right, we're going to have. Thank you, Alex. We now have a five minute interval where people can prepare their questions. We're ready to start the questions. And uh, I'd like to start with some questions from the audience, please. We've got a roving mic. Yes, at the back there. Yes. Uh, just hold on. We will for the Zoom. You stand here. You've got talking to him. You hold it for me. Excellent. Uh, roughly what sort of proportion of staff are involved in the musical side, the vocal side, the production side, and the admin side of the opera? Because if you go to a cinema, the stars come down and there's half a dozen stars and there's five million other people. Do you need five million other people for your audience? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, uh yes no yes no um so uh, to mount a typical production a, a new production uh i think the question is how many people what, what are the degrees of contribution from around the company to putting a typical production on and for example uh we're doing benjamin Britten's midsummer night's dream at the moment uh and that's got a core cast of about 10 or so principles children's chorus of about 20, there's 50 odd in the orchestra, and then there's a running team, as it were, who run the show, who've got probably about 40 or so by the time we've done stage crew, stage management, wigs, costume, makeup. But behind that, there's also a team of people who've made the scenery, painted the scenery, built uh, the costumes, um, made the wigs in this case. We've also got some specialist people who have uh, installed the equipment for flying the performers up and down. There's a small haulage company that has to move us around. Um, so, I mean, typically speaking, uh, production of that scale would have about 120 people touring, having had another 40 or 50 people involved at various stages in the making of it. Um, Scottish Opera has a core of about 120 of which 50, 50 or so of those are in the orchestra. So that leaves about 70, and that's spread relatively evenly across many departments, all of which are very small. So there's a, uh, for want of a better way of listing it, there's a small finance, HR, a slightly larger marketing and comms and press team. There's a fundraising team. Uh, we then have music staff. We've got um, um, uh, heads of department across all of our making, you know, scenery, props, costumes. And we then supplement all of those with uh, the freelance pool, which, as I said earlier, has been uh, depleted through the film and TV sector. But those are the sort of broadly speaking. We, I mean, it's one of the reasons why opera as an art form is quite hard to get your head into from a making point of view is that in some respects, the music staff represent all of the uh, uh, kind of learning that is that you know kind of sits across a 400 year period in terms of their knowledge of scores and composers and music. 
And on the other hand, you, uh, at the other end of that, you've got a digital department within the marketing team who make the little podcasts like the one we saw up on screen earlier. So we're sitting across 400 years of tradition. One of the things I ought to just probably go on to say is that uh, I've always strived to do is to maintain as many of these uh, making jobs in Scotland as possible. And to do that, we've kind of tried to feed as many young people as we can into our pipeline to ensure that particularly the costume cutting, the scenery making, the scenery painting skills stay alive and well here in Scotland. Does that answer your question? Just like a film. After that, after <laughs> yeah, like a film, indeed. Yeah. Okay, let's take a question from our Zoom audience. Now, my fellow council member, Geraint, at the back, is looking into those for us. Geraint, have we got a question? Yes, we, we have a few here. Um, first one, what has been the influence of the opera school on the progress of Scottish opera? What's the, what's the, pro, what's the influence of the opera school? on the progress of Scottish opera? Uh, the, <clears throat> that's good, the Alexander Gibson Opera School, which is uh, uh, contained within the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Uh, it's a very important part of the pipeline preparing young singers for uh, life in the world of opera. We have uh, quite a strong um, uh, mentoring relationship. Uh, we offer um, uh, for it, let me go back a bit, for a time, we were able to work closely with the opera school to actually present uh, productions where they would provide much of the cast, we'd provide the orchestra, um, scenery, costumes, staff, etc. As times have moved on, that uh, hasn't been possible, but we still maintain a very active interest in the children, young people, sorry, going into the opera school. We uh, uh, audition them all um, to, under, to, to see what uh, stage of development they're at. Uh, when they are ready, and sometimes it's post postgrad, they'll be ready to come into our, our own emerging artist program, which is designed to prepare young singers for life in the world of opera. Uh, yeah, we also do side by side uh, with the opera school with uh, Stuart, our music director, um, runs a, a small conducting course there. We also have instrumental side by sides with some of their instrumentalists and our orchestra on particular projects, and also many of their production arts, uh, young people, uh, come up through our various making and running teams. A very strong relationship, fostered by or enhanced by the fact that we are literally neighbours on Hope Street and neighbours on Garski Road. Thank you. Question from the audience? Yes. Pat. Down the front. Um, at the beginning, you defined opera partly as telling a story with music. I'd like to ask you might, what might sound like a kind of Philistine question. I hope you won't take it that way. But what's the difference then between an opera and a musical? A difference good. between an opera and a musical. Yeah, that's a good that's question. A good that's a good question. Um, I, I think to an extent, the short answer is partly depends on uh, whether you're in the mood for an opera or a musical. I mean, in many respects, opera and musicals inhabit very similar territory. I mean, I think it's fair to say that typically to sing opera requires a great deal more uh, vocal skill and preparation. Uh, and certainly to play for an opera often requires a good deal of uh, musical skill and preparation because typically it's an orchestra of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, whereas many of the musicals inhabit a world due to financial reasons of uh, simple keyboards, piano, drums, bass, etc. I think the very best musicals absolutely cross the boundaries between uh, either um, shallow or derivative uh, storytelling versus some of the great emotional pull and power of a night at the opera. Uh, someone like Stephen Sondheim, an amazing kind of composer who straddles the territory between the two really effectively, really well. Uh, I think, it, as I say, I think it's partly a matter of taste. It's partly a matter of technical uh, experience and expertise as a performer. Um, yeah, and it's partly the complexity of the um, of what's required of you as a performer or a musician. Does that give you is that an answer that works? Yeah, okay. Geraint, another question from our or Zoom audience. Uh, what is your view of cultural appropriation? Should Madame Butterfly be Japanese? Mm -hmm. uh, should Madame Butterfly be Japanese? Uh, I, I presume the other question is the character Madame Butterfly, but um, 
well, the character is Japanese indeed, in Madam Butterfly. Uh, I think it's interesting. That's a question that we are uh, beginning to bump into much more frequently. I think for a long time, there was an expectation that, an acceptance that uh, particularly if the voice was right, then nothing else really mattered. In other words, if the, the artist could sing the role, that's what mattered most of all. We've then, as I alluded to in my talk, moved to an era perhaps uh, where uh, the directors have an expectation of a degree of verisimilitude, which has led to performers perhaps, for example, Mimi uh, is often now cast as someone who looks as though they could be dying as opposed to someone who might not be. Um, we've also moved now into a world where actually questions of cultural identity, cultural appropriation, are uh, uh, featuring very much alive and well. And I think it's actually a really big question that we as an art form, along with all of the other performing arts, need to be asking ourselves, can you present Madam Butterfly? Uh, should you be doing it if you don't have an appropriate Japanese woman to sing the role? It, it kind of presumes you can find someone to sing the role, but it's all, vocally, but also uh, there is, there's a wider question in my view, which is the opera is not only about cultural appropriation and cultural identity, but it's also about terrible sexual behaviors. And to what extent can they and should they be represented on stage? And so the challenge for us going forward, and certainly we're doing our best to meet this head on, is to ask ourselves of every opera we're looking to present, what is in it that is um, that either you know has attitudes or tropes that need to be changed, addressed, tweaked, edited out, but also in doing all of this, how can we still tell these amazing stories? How can we still tell and bring these amazing operas to the stage? So I think the short answer is it's a very alive question. Do we have the perfect answer to it? No. I mean, you also, for example, with Madame Butterfly have really interesting cultural issues, for example, uh, we sometimes think of that part of the world as being a bit homogenous. And actually it's frequently done that a woman of Korean, perhaps, or Chinese descent is cast as Madame Butterfly. Actually, from that part of the world, is that the right answer? Probably not. So um, one, of the, one of the approaches, for example, that our cousins at Welsh National Opera took, they've just recently presented um, Madame Butterfly but set it in a sort of dystopian future sometime in the 2030s, which was to do with all the boundaries being down, as it were, and that enabled them to uh, bring to the stage of production that uh, wasn't about race in that particular way. But then one of the challenges is, Madame Butterfly, the reason she commits suicide is this question of honor. And if you don't have the cultural setting of honor in place, what is it then that propels her to her death? And, um, and I, to be honest, I'm not sure that production answered that question, but I thought it was a very interesting mm. reading of the piece. Yeah, yeah. Question from the audience, I think. Tricia, somebody in the middle there? Thank you. Bill, I think it was you. Just picking up on the point before about musicals, uh, in, in theatre, uh, this has changed a lot, hasn't it? I mean, there's a lot more music now in theatre, uh, which has been which has been brought in for sudden change in atmosphere. Um, do you think the same thing might happen in opera? There might be more, for example, spoken voice without it descending into um, music musicals? I, I think... Um... Yes, I, I think the role of spoken voice and or recitative in contemporary productions does feature. Uh, it is one of the tools that often either young writers or young composers play with. Um, one of the interesting sort of trends in contemporary composition is actually the absence of singing for uh, groups. It's often this person sings, then that person responds, as opposed to writing for a chorus. So one of the things we're trying to encourage composers to do is to be bolder in writing for a larger group of people. Uh, it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer because so many of the individual new commissions will have elements or shades or nuances of this and evidence. Thank you. Grant, have you got a question? Yep. Um, you so we've talked about the importance of commissioning new work. How do you go about selecting, commissioning and producing a new opera? Uh, that's a good question. I th if I heard it correctly, the question is, how do we go about commissioning new work? Um, uh, 
it's quite a long answer, <laughs> but I'll do my best to stay moderate. Um, it's linked to that question I wanted to ask, which is if you have a writer who would like to get involved in opera, what, what would they do, you know? Okay, so, I mean, essentially, much of much of this remains relatively uh, informal, right. as it were. I mean, certainly when we were doing the 515 projects in 2008, 9 and 10, it started because a particular composer came to me knowing that the door was relatively wide open. A particular composer came to me and said, do you know, I've got this idea. Would you be interested in thinking about it? And that led me to developing the, th the thought process, if you like, that was if we as an opera company bet the family farm on one new full length opera without knowing how developed their writing composing skills are, then that's too big a bet for an opera company because yeah, actually yeah, opera is yeah. just too hard to do from the get go. Yeah. So I then thought, what if we created a safe space where perhaps five productions each of 15 minutes and that led to conversations some that I initiated, others as the word got round. So writers and composers came to us, including, um, interestingly, uh, in conversation with Craig Armstrong, film composer based here in Glasgow, very interested in finding his way into this art form. And the idea he expressed to me seemed like an idea that someone like writer Ian Rankin would be interested in uh, talking about. And so uh, one of the happy introductions was between Ian and Craig. And that was a sort of, you know, just trying to think about what sort of a writer could meet, would work with a uh, composer. Uh, um, uh, probably the most successful pairing has been with uh, composer Stuart McRae and uh, writer Louise Welsh, uh, who went on from a 515 piece called Remembrance Day, if I've got it correct, then to do um, uh, Ghost Patrol, then on to Devil Inside, and then finally Anthropocene. That started with a 15 minute idea. Then they built their skills to becoming a 30 minute, moved on to an hour and finally a two hour opera. Uh, if anyone, and I'll put this out there, if anyone has any ideas around or desire to get involved with either writing or composing, just come and see me. The door's always open. But I would say it's almost impossible to present, you know, a, a, a work of an epic scale. Don't try and set Moby Dick to music, for example. You know, have an idea that is around essentially a domestic drama you know, two or three people. Mm. I mean, talking about Verdi's Macbeth earlier, mm. what is that essentially in operatic form? It's essentially an incredibly intense domestic drama, yeah. the risk of being reductivist. But, you know, that, that's what matters. That's the thing that captures an audience's interest. It also uh, enables, through the use of music, all of the, um, all of the codes and subtleties to be conveyed without having to have lots and lots of words. So short, simple ideas, fewer characters, particularly if you can avoid getting too engaged with a chorus at the outset, it helps save the money. So the smaller the idea, but the stronger the idea, the better a chance we get of getting it staged. And we do it always, we always have one or two or three new ideas in the pipeline. And it's amazing how many of them come from, oh, a wee, you know, a wee idea arrives on an email or a wee idea turns up uh, in a face-to-face -face conversation somewhere. Yeah. I know that sounds a bit informal and a bit kind of, anecdotal, a little bit car crashy, I guess it is, but at the moment we don't have, in the UK, there isn't really a formal librettist, librettist or opera composing uh, um, framework other than the really good work going on at the Guild Hall School of Music in London. Question there. Hello, uh, this is a question about capturing the young I, I fell in love with the idea of opera when I, I don't know, I must have been about 10, and I watched the great Caruso and Mario Lanza pegging out at the very end, singing from Pagliacci. Um, I've never become very sophisticated. Uh, I don't particularly go in for modern opera, you know, maybe Corngo would be the, uh, would be my limit. But I wonder about your school productions. Do you go for melody or drama? I mean, what kind of repertoire do you give to the kids to try and, you know, sell the idea of opera to them? I could tune. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, so uh, I think in my talk, I talked about visiting roughly 100 primary schools every year. 
there is no pre-existing body of work that we can bring to the primary schools. So every year we commission, or every two years probably, we commission a new uh, 30 minute, 40 minute piece for approximately 100 school children to perform. And it is absolutely the combination of melody and drama, but we try to find a subject I mean, it could be environmental, it could be, we've done a piece uh, around um, introducing uh, children to um, China. Uh, there was a piece uh, um, around COP26 that we created. It's normally presented, what is created to be about 100 kids divided into three groups, as it were. And then we bring appropriate costumes and small props with us. They learn the music in advance. And then on the day, three or four of the Scottish Opera team are in the room, they each take team each. Uh, teach them uh, the appropriate moves, the kind of big crowd moves, and bring to life these uh, short operas. But they work because they are all about easy melody, but yet quite sophisticated writing around quite complex subjects, but appropriately aimed at the sort of P3s, P4s that we, uh, that we um, perform them with. Don't determine to get in front of as many school kids as possible. And we, you know, noting that some of the schools we do this work in, there can easily be 20 or 30 or 40 languages spoken within that school. So for many of the uh, uh, children involved in these performances, it is, you know, they're, you know, very so often their only introduction to our art form because it's not necessarily something they would ex experience within their own households. So we definitely determine to spread it across as many of the local authorities as, as we can every year. Brian, have we any more questions? Yeah, uh, if I can combine two here, what makes a great opera and what opera would you recommend for a first time opera goer? Um, so good question, what makes a great opera? I mean, sometimes at the risk of being a little facetious, a great opera is the one we're doing just now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, so facetiousness aside, that's partly because that is obviously the op opera that is foremost in your mind, because that's the one we're seeing every day in rehearsals, we're seeing it on stage, we're experiencing the audience reaction to it. Um, I, I think what, for me, what makes a great opera is a performance where myself, and I include myself as one of the audience, where we go away not only uh, impressed by the quality of the singing, the music making, the staging, theatricality, but also where it touches us somewhere inside. And, you know, what is a great opera for me is not a great opera for any one of you there, because it's partly who we are as human beings and where we are in various stages in our lives, whether we've got the car parked without getting irritated. You know, it's all the stuff that comes to being in a theater or indeed seeing it on the screen. But when we get it right, that particular opera can be a great opera. I mean, you know, the three, the three greats, the three top 10 operas that I mentioned earlier, the Traviata, the Carmen and the La Boheme, why are they great operas? Because they are, I believe they are stories about real human beings, about real travails that many of us or all of us have experienced, set to some of the most amazing music you're ever gonna bump into. You know, and I think that that combination is what makes a great performance. Um, a, a good opera to start with. Uh, what we so I'm, I'm not gonna answer that directly, but I'm gonna say that what we found with our under 26 audience is that they more often come to the uh, better known titles. And when we get it right, they come away really uh, pleased with that experience. Um, I'd, I'd have said uh, a particular opera that really is the great, the right place to start is La Boheme, because it's about young people. Uh, it's, it's incredibly recognizable tunes. The story is incredibly compelling. And, you know, as one of its virtues, it's relatively short. And it's amazing how much <laughs> that also appeals to people now. Okay, there's a gentleman there. Good questions. First part's a simple question. You mentioned funding from the taxpayer. Roughly what percentage of your funding does come from the taxpayer? The second part is a bit more complex. You mentioned and very well covered very well 400 years of opera and almost all of the operas you've mentioned are either French, German or Italian and they are sung in French, German and Italian. Whereas in the last hundred years we've had popular music 
and it is almost uniquely sung in English. ABBA, Springsteen, The Beatles, Queen are all sung in English. Eurovision Song Contest, over half the songs are in English. Why do we not have more English operas or sung in English operas? Okay, um, yes, yeah, that's quite a big question. Um, go back a bit uh, to answer the first part. Um, uh, our funding from the Scottish Government is, uh, so when I started 16 years ago, it was roughly a little over 80% of our funding was from the Scottish Government and the rest of it was earned income. These days we're more 65% subsidy and 35 odd percent earned income. Uh, these things are never, you can never pour concrete on that particular ratio because it depends on how well we do in fundraising, box office sales, earned income from the rental of our productions. And obviously also, you know, Sc Scottish government funding has regrettably only had one trajectory, which is um, uh, steadily downhill in real terms, certainly. And so, but we, we certainly endeavour to pull as much funding together as we can from a source of all the sources we can get our hands on to squeeze it as hard as we can to push as many opera killer jewels out of it as is humanly possible. Um, second question about English. Um, the use of English language but predominantly uh, across opera versus perhaps more popular music. I, I think there is a lot more opera written in English than perhaps might be immediately obvious. Um, certainly here in the UK. The works of Benjamin Britten, you know, obviously feature prominently, but uh, I think we then in the UK went through a period where there was uh, less opera composed in sort of the latter part of the mid to latter part of the 20th century. So there isn't as big a body of operas written in English. I guess every other country will typically write in the operas in, the, in their own language. So if you're a new composer in France, you'll write in French typically. Uh, Dutch, Dutch, uh, etc. But interestingly, popular music, English is always the typically the language chosen because it's the most one of the most universal languages. And so people will write from whatever nationality in English, knowing that it gives them the best chance of getting their work heard, seen and sold, I think is the answer to that. But I'm on slightly, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't absolutely hold me to that. But that, that's what I think. Last question. This will have to be the last. Whether you see any differences in the climate for opera in New Zealand and in Scotland? That's a good question. Um, do I see any differences in the climate for opera compared between New Zealand and Scotland? Uh, okay, the big difference is that for some really bizarre, crazy reason, opera finds it very hard to get any government support in New Zealand. So when I ran New Zealand opera, that was on about 14 and a half percent subsidy and the rest of it was earned income. So every fortnight it was hell trying to get to the wages. And you just knew whether you were selling opera or not, what the financial outcome was gonna be. Uh, I think um, indeed, interestingly, but one of the things I learned from my time in New Zealand was that actually, we could be much braver about commissioning new work. And so that was one of the energies, I suppose, that I brought with me here that set and train the 515 story. So um, I think audiences in general around New Zealand enjoy the art form as much as they do here. One of the other interesting differences that at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, there was a great deal of celebration of civic pride. So a goodly number of thousand seat opera houses were built. And um, when you go small scale touring in New Zealand, you go on a much larger scale than perhaps you might do in some of the communities here. So uh, the world of uh, amateur opera, operetta, musicals is incredibly alive there, as indeed many of the program companies are here. Lots of similarities, huge financial differences. Um, yeah, and as enthusiastically received there as it is here, but it's just a tougher thing to keep going there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, with that, I think uh, it's time for us to thank you, Alex. I think it's been a fascinating talk. You've, you've had to cover a huge range of issues, and it's not easy to do that. And it can't be easy to do your job, I'm sure, when bringing all these things to, to create, as you say, the magic of opera. So I'd like us all to thank you very much. <laughs>